This morning, as I've mentioned for a couple weeks, we're going to begin a new series working through what would be the third book of the Psalms, the, the section that is covering the Psalms right in the middle of what we consider our, our book of Psalms. The, the Psalms are arranged in what we would call the Psalter, or sometimes you hear it that way, that the Jews arranged and, and divided these Psalms really into five books probably because of the size of scrolls back in the day, but they, they had five groupings or five books, and we retain that in our Bibles. You'll see over the book, uh, over the heading of some Psalms, all of a sudden you'll see a, a name that says book one and then book two. Well, we're coming up on book three here, back in 2015 through 2017. If way back in that time, we went through the, the first book. That was Psalms 1 through 41. During the COVID year of 2020, which is already in our past now, it still seems like yesterday in most of our minds, but that's back several years. Three, we went through the second book of the Psalter, Psalms 42 through 72. Well, this morning we're picking up, as you can see, with Psalm 73. And I'm going to, to begin a series that runs through this entire book of the Psalms. That's 73 through Psalm 89. That means that because of breaks and so forth, this series will probably run till about Easter. So it'll be in during that time frame. Now, I expect that as you open your Bible to the Psalms this morning, you, you probably recognize that we're coming to a unique book. The, the Psalms contain the, the very songs and the prayers that God gave to ancient Israel. While, while many of the Psalms were composed by David, by no means were all of them, in fact, we're beginning a section now where several of the psalms are attributed to a man by the name Asaph. And I'll tell you a little bit more about him in, in a little bit. Several of the psalms actually have no attribution. We don't have any idea who wrote them or where they fit into the history of Israel because these were composed over many years and collected over a long period of time. The actual composition spanned many generations of, of Israel's history. And then for centuries it took before they found their final order that we have them now. There, there seems to be some level of arrangement to the Psalter in that there's some groupings at times of themes, but by and large, each psalm stands on its own. It's a unique piece of Hebrew poetry. Which brings us to the, the next significant thing that I want to explain before we dive in. I want to mention before we dive in here that this is, as I said, poetry. Poetry, that, that means that these psalms have elements of poetry, and what make poetry unique. As poetry, there, there's a, a density about them. Uh, it, it, compared to other types of literature, there's a density in the words. The, the lines are intended to convey images to our minds, so they paint word pictures in, in a very dense fashion. Yet for us to really understand the pictures being created, we have to spend time contemplating the words, meditating on them. Well, that's one of the marks of poetry. Another mark of good poetry, and I would say the Psalms are great poetry, not just good poetry. A, a mark of good poetry is that it does not only communicate facts, it communicates emotions. The Psalms teach us how to feel, not just what we are to know, they are communicating motion to us. They, they are, are the, telling us not just how we should know things in our minds, but how our affections should be shaped. Here's proper affections to have. Many of them guide us in how we should express the emotion that we have as, as image bearers to the God who gave us his image. As well as how we should manage the emotions that, that come up in our lives as we go through the very circumstances that, that we encounter. 
Now, I have multiple goals for this series as we work through the Psalms. One of those goals is, is I want us to understand what each Psalm is teaching. There is an intellectual component. I want us to know what this Psalm teaches. Beyond that, though, I have a second component. I, I want us to, to feel the emotions that the Psalm is conveying. But even that's not enough. I want us to thirdly uh, allow each of these Psalms to shape our own affections. To, to shape our affections as we contemplate what each psalm reveals about our God. Now, these three goals are not achievable if your entire exposure to the psalm is the short time that we spend with it here in a service. So, for this series, I'm going to put a challenge before you. For the duration of this cheer- series, for the next several months, I challenge you to commit yourself to reading the psalm that we cover every Sunday, every day of the week after. So this week we're covering Psalm 73. Monday through Saturday this coming week, read Psalm 73 again. Now, that's really not a big ask. If you read this psalm and Psalm 73 is in the midside range, the very few, I think there's only three larger in this book. If you read this psalm, it takes two or three minutes if you just read it straight through. So I'm not asking a lot to simply read it, but actually I would challenge you to set more like 10 minutes aside. Don't just read the psalm, but then take one or two of the thoughts that are communicated in the psalm and spend a couple minutes thinking about that thought, meditating on, on what the psalm is teaching. And then spend a couple minutes in prayer to God about that thought that you've been meditating on that contemplation. I guarantee that if you do these three things, if you read, meditate, and pray, you will discover that your affections are being shaped over the next several months. You'll you'll find your awe for God increasing. And after all, that is our stated goal this year, right? Our, Our theme this year is standing in awe of God. We want to be in awe of God, and awe is an effective response, a response of our affections. So I challenge you to to spend this time shaping your affections over the coming month as we work through this series. Let's start looking at our psalm this morning, Psalm 73. Psalm 73 is a personal psalm. Asaph, our our attributed author author here, he's experiencing a problem. It's an intellectual dilemma he has, but, but his intellectual dilemma is giving him emotions that he's struggling with. It's really something a lot like the mental challenges that we face often. Asaph is looking at things going on. He's comparing his life to the life of others. And he's getting discouraged. He's getting discouraged about life. Life is showing itself to be, from his perspective, patently unfair. Sound familiar? How often have you compared yourself with someone else and concluded that you are coming out on the downside of that comparison? You are not as athletic. You are not as creative. You are not as attractive. You are not as successful. You are not as witty. You are not as wealthy. And so on. Asaph, we'll see, is having that kind of problem in this psalm. He's comparing himself. He's coming out on the downside. And as he thinks about that, emotions are resulting. So who is Asaph? Asaph was a man who was in a unique position to observe people. According to First and Second Chronicles, Asaph is one of the leaders of music appointed by King David. He served before the Ark of God in Jerusalem when David brought the Ark to the city. Furthermore, he was still there when King Solomon dedicated the temple that he built after his father David died. He led the music on that grand occasion of dedicating this great building that was there to worship God. So apparently he served for many years as one of the chief musicians of of Israel. He led in their worship. and In our terms, we might think of Asaph as a professional musician working at the greatest cultural center of the day. He worked there at the temple of God. So if we think about it, Asaph's position there, it placed him to be in a unique position to observe people of Israel. 
all the Israelites were required to come to the temple at various times for various festivals, according to the law of Moses. They were to gather for these festivals. Furthermore, there were times when both King David and King Solomon mandated that the people of Israel come to Jerusalem. So it wasn't just a religious requirement, now it became a requirement of the state government. You must come to the city of Jerusalem and gather for a festivity of some kind. All the people of Israel came to where Asaph was working. Asaph was in a position that allowed him to observe both the, the, the small and the great of, of the nation. Most likely in that position of prominence at that national worship center, he would rub shoulders with the most influential people of the nation. After all, chief musicians are oftentimes celebrities that people gather around, the influential people. So he's in a position to observe people. People as they came and went from the center of worship over the year, and as he observed these people, this problem developed in his mind. Since Asaph wrote this psalm from a, a personal perspective, and, and since his problem is a common problem, I've decided I'm going to word the problem in a personal way, hoping that it will help us understand more clearly how it relates. Let's state the problem this way. The problem, I envy the lifestyles of the worldly. I envy the lifestyles of the worldly. That's our problem today. We see this really in the first 16 verses. But this morning, I want to put ourselves in Asaph's position. Let's think about things the way that he thinks about them. Let's see things the way he sees them. I envy the lifestyles of the worldly. We're going to work our way through these verses, but initially, look at the first two verses with me. Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. Verse 1 here is a statement of theological truth. This is what I might call the, the Sunday school answer that every Israelite could have given to answer the question of who is God good toward? I've watched all of you in Sunday school. Well, actually, not all of you. Some of you failed to show up for Sunday school. Shame on you. But I've watched many of you in Sunday school, and I know you're able to give the Sunday school answers to these kind of questions. Who is God good toward? Well, every Israelite would be able to answer, God is good toward Israel. After all, we're Abraham's descendants, they could explain. We're God's chosen people. We know these facts. We know that, that God, then, if we even want to expand further, God blesses those who are pure in heart. That, that means specifically those who have a single-minded devotion to God doesn't necessarily mean they have that, but they can say that. They, they understand that's the answer. Well, Asaph knows these truths too. He can give the answer, and he states them easily. Look at that first word, surely. In his mind, these are simple truths that should have a subtle place. This is the answer. But, but, as for me, that, that phrase there that starts verse 2, that is about as emphatic as you can make something in Hebrew. The fact of the matter is that even though our psalmist here knows the right answer, the Sunday school answer, that knowledge did not keep him from consuming doubts and discouragements. These unbidden thoughts came to his mind that, that caused him to nearly give up on the truths that he could affirm in Sunday school. In just a moment, we'll look at the doubts that, that crowded out the, the, the things he knew, that, that crowded into the mind here of our psalmist. We'll look at them, but as we do, as we read through them, I want us to, to notice, I want to prepare you to notice that when we read God is crowded out by two words, I and they. As Asaph records what causes him to slip, his thoughts are governed by a comparison of I and they. His emotions are being governed by this comparison, this, this observation between himself and others. He's not thinking about God directly, he's thinking about I and they. 
the eyes and they of life. Asaph mentions several of these specific observations, but they really boil down to two general observations about the worldly people. The first observation comes in verses 3 through 9. Their lives, those people, not I, their lives, are filled with success and ease. Their lives are filled with success and ease. Look at verse 3. For I was envious of the arrogant, as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there were, are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eyes bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue parades through the earth. Now, you may have noticed as I start out reading these verses that the psalmist says he's looking at the wicked, whereas you look on screen and I use the word, I envy the worldly. I, I did that intentionally. I, I think that when we read the wicked in verse 3, we think of really bad people. Uh, the wicked, those were the people there. They're like Satan worshipers, right? They're, they're at least very violent sinners, murderers and, and adulterers and prostitutes, and that's the wicked. Well, the Old Testament term for wicked is a much broader term than that. It's a much more general term. The, the word simply means those who are guilty. In other words, guilty before God. Psalm 1, the very first psalm that you encounter as you come to the Psalter, it explains that the wicked are, are simply those who are opposite those who walk in the way of the Lord. You have those who walk in the way of the Lord, they're blessed by God. Psalm 1 says, then you have the wicked. The wicked are not so, as those who walk after God. They are simply, the wicked are simply those who do not follow God. In New Testament, these same people are referred to as worldly. They, they seek after things of this world rather than the things of God. Think about it. Our, our psalmist here, he spent his entire adult life, really, in, in the temple, from what we know. The, the people he saw were not people who were openly defiant of God, they're going through the motions of worship. They're coming to the temple. And yet to his eyes, it was obvious that many of them, many of the most successful of them, were not devoted to God. They were filled with pride. They were more concerned with wealth and righteousness. They were arrogant and boastful. They, they were acting like they ob obtained all the success through their own efforts their own smarts. They went through the motions of worship, but they lived as if God did not exist. He knew that as soon as they left this place, he knew the reputations, he had heard the stories, he knew that as soon as they left here, they bullied and, and intimidated people to get what they wanted. They were always scheming for more and more. And to make matters worse, it, it seemed like everything they did worked. No one held them accountable for their wrongdoings. They, they could do these things outside in the city, and then they could walk into the temple and go through the motions of worship, and nobody ever challenged them. Never did a single person act as if anything was amiss. More likely, there were people fawning to them, praising them for their ever-so-obvious piety that they came to worship. Does that feel like the world you live in? There are rumors of scandalous situations surrounding most of the successful people in our world. Many of them openly flaunt their arrogance and pride. They, they get caught in improprieties of all kinds and they just laugh it off and move on as if nothing's happened. And they get away with it. They turn around and pretend that they are the pillars of the community all the while, they're, they're building their personal fiefdoms. It's as if they live above the daily frustrations that the rest of us face day in and day out, and everybody lets them go with it. 
Politicians, of course, are an easy illustration in this regard, aren't they, in our day? Men and women who spend their entire adult lives in what we would call public service, and yet somehow they accumulate personal wealth in the millions. Until recently, it was a customary election practice that when the election cycle was rolling around, all of those politicians would claim to be Christians show up for worship services, right? Show up somewhere, make sure it was a photo op if they went in and out of a church at election season. Of course, they're not alone. There are countless other examples that we could turn to that, that express the same idea. Very few of the people that we would think of, though, are openly defiant of God. Yet God has no direct relevance in any way that they live their lives. They, they present themselves as controlling their own destiny. That's what Asaph is dealing with here. That's what we deal with. That's what leads us to envy the lifestyles of the worldly. They live their lives filled with success and ease. It makes it so easy to envy them. That leads to a second general observation. Not only are their lives filled with success and ease, their lives are unburdened by righteousness. Unburdened by righteousness. Look at verse 10. Continuing on. Therefore his people return to this place, and waters of abundance are drunk by them. They say, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, and always at ease they have increased in wealth, surely in vain, I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. For I have been stricken all day long and chastened, chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would betray the generation of your children. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. If the psalmist thinks about the fact that these people out there, the, the unnamed they, they're living their lives as if God had no relevance, he, he recognizes that in reality they go further than that. These worldly people live as if God has no authority in their lives. It's not just as if he has no relevance, he has no authority. They have no concern at all that God might hold them accountable. They act as if he doesn't exist at all. He realizes when they dismiss God in this way, when they just ignore God, that completely frees them to pursue power and pleasure in any way they choose. There, there's no restraint on them. They, there's no limit to their activities. They, they can live as hedonistically as they please. But by contrast, our psalmist who has worked hard to follow the principles they recognize as God laid down in his law, he feels like his efforts have been for naught. He's put all these restraints around himself, and where has it gotten him? Living the so-called pure life has not gotten him ahead, at least not as far as he can see. The others have the money, the power, the prestige. They live life with gusto. He lives life with continual restraint. They live with ease. He lives with pain and frustration. In fact, as he thinks about it, it seems as if God has brought affliction into his life as reward for all of his pursuit of innocence. It seems as if when it comes to handing out trials for the day, God just kind of skips over these other people. They just keep right on living their lives, unburdened by all the demands of righteousness that he has placed upon himself. Our psalmist here, Asaph, he's suffering a strong dose of what I call the poor me syndrome. I'm sure we can all think of times when the poor me syndrome has, has struck us. I remember one time when I worked in the corporate world years ago, I was part of a... a large, very successful sales pursuit team. In, in fact, our success on this sales team far exceeded what the corporation had expected would happen. They, they expected us to just win a little slice of the business and we won a huge amount of business. So the co company arranged to fly the entire pursuit team to Puerto Rico for a long weekend, all expense paid. 
The problem was our spouses were not included in the trip. Furthermore, I, I knew from previous stories of similar trips that the expectation was that it would really be one long weekend of company-funded, rather debauched partying. That, that clearly wasn't a place for me, so I desired, using the, the language of verse 13, my, my desire was to wash my hands in innocence. There's no way I could do that on this kind of environment, so I declined the trip. I was the only member of the team to deny or decline the trip. The, the rest, they, they were, using his language, unburdened by, by righteous type of, of concerns. As a result, I was also the only team member when they returned that had the poor me syndrome. Because they came back talking about all the great times they'd had on the beaches and the banquets that were held over those, I don't remember, I think it was four days. I didn't have any of that. Poor me. Before we leave this topic of unburdened righteousness, I want us to note there's one other aspect that our psalmist had to deal with that, that the wicked of his day simply did not have to address. It's in verse 15. Asaph adds to all of these other frustrations, he adds the realization that, that he was tempted to express the doubts that were swirling around in his head to others in the believing community of Israel. His frustrations led him to want to openly discuss these questions, to, to ask, is it really worth it for us to live so carefully, or would we just be better off to chuck it all? That's what's going on in his head, and he wanted to talk about it. What stopped him from doing that was an understanding that if he took that step, if, if he shared his thoughts with others, if he asked them, is it possible the wicked are really better off than we are? He might actually lead others to doubt as well. Those who were not doubting now might start to doubt, and he might lead others into sin who would not sin otherwise. Those unburdened by righteousness, they had absolutely no concern if they produced right unrighteousness in others. By contrast, he cared. He cared that his actions did not lead others to unrighteous actions. That was another burden he carried. Another thing to envy those who didn't carry that burden. Let me ask you, do you feel the emotion? Do, do you sense the angst that he's having? Why do others have it so easy when I have it so hard? Why do I work so hard to remain righteous when others don't? Why can't I have just a little bit of what they have? I want some of the fun. I want some of the ease. I want some of the pleasure. I want some of the sin. In Sunday school, I can give the answer, God is good. But deep down, I envy those who live worldly. I may not openly admit it, but I envy them. That is the problem. I envy the lifestyle of the worldly. Remember the verses we just looked at, they, they have the I and they, the I's and they's pushed out God. Well, it should come as no surprise then that the resolution to the problem needs to change that. With verse, six, or verse 17, we hit the, the turning point in this psalm, the, the hinge point, the swinging, where the emotions give way to understanding. We have the resolution. I remember the ultimate reality of God. I envy the lifestyle of the worldly, that's the problem. I resolve that problem as I remember the ultimate reality of God. Look at verse 17. Until I came into the sanctuary of God... Then I perceive their end. Our psalmist worked at the temple. But now he truly enters the sanctuary of God. Rather than looking around at the people who were there, he turned his attention back to God who was worshipped there. The greatness of God, the majesty of God, the glory of God once more captivates him as he contemplates the ultimate reality 
of things instead of the present appearance of things. We need to do likewise. Friends, attending church is really the most important thing you can do. The most important thing. It's not because I think you need to hear the sound of my voice. It's not because I want you to come out and validate my employment or anything of that nature. You need to be here because this is where we are all reminded of the ultimate reality of God. Out there, as we leave and go about our lives during the week, out there are situations that can cause us to doubt. Things that that cause us to focus on the I and the they. Here is where we're reminded that those things are not ultimate. God is ultimate. In fact, let's be honest, even here, We can be distracted like the psalmist was. We can be distracted by by looking at one another. I guarantee that if you look around at the people sitting in this room long enough and careful enough, you'll find that the things out there are brought in here too. Because we're still a bunch of sinners. We're imperfect. The imperfect lives of the people around us will reflect some of that at times. But we're not here to look at one another. We're here to love one another, but we're not here to look at one another. We're here to look at God. We are singing about God. We are reading about God. We are praying to God. We are worshiping God. And we need that. We need that. Worship is what helps us remember that the world around us tries to cause us to forget. Worship reminds us that God is is the ultimate reality. The first thing that comes through thinking about the ultimate reality of God is recognizing that though they out there, they will encounter sudden and complete judgment. Reading at verse 18. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors like a dream when one awakes. O Lord, when roused, you will despise their form. A day of judgment is coming. Divine, holy judgment. When when that day comes, any apparent security, any prosperity, any accumulation that they have in this life, it will not help. Verse 18 Surely, that's the same word that started verse 1. Except now we can sense that our psalmist is, is working with a deeper level of conviction. Surely, this will happen. There will come a day when as if God is waking up from his sleep, verse 20, A day when God wakes up and suddenly drops judgment on the wicked of the worldly. Those who have ignored him, when that that day comes, they will be destroyed in a moment. They will be utterly swept away, verse 19. Now, I've seen rather humorous videos of people who are standing on uh, rocks along the shoreline. A wave, a large wave suddenly comes in and splashes up over the rock, flattens the people and moves them several feet back. I'm sure you've probably seen similar things as well. Well, that is nothing compared to the sudden devastation that comes when God's judgment arrives. The Bible says that judgment on those who have ignored God will come in a flash. And they will be swept away, utterly destroyed. They will be taken to an eternity in the lake of fire. Complete, absolute, eternally ongoing devastation. When God's judgment comes... The wicked will be flattened and swept away. Those who live as if God is irrelevant will be swept away. When we recognize that truth, when we contemplate that sudden and complete judgment lies in the future of of these people, why would we envy the worldly now? We should mourn them. We should pity them. We should grieve them. We should have compassion on them, but why would we envy them? There's no reason. 
to envy the worldly. They will encounter sudden and complete judgment. We also remember, I already have the eternal assurance of the sovereign God. I already have the eternal assurance of the sovereign God. Verse 21. When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. As soon as the eternal perspective is brought back into the picture, our psalmist here recognizes that he had made a huge mistake in his assessment of things. Huge he had been, verse 22, senseless and ignorant. He, he reflected as much spiritual understanding here as an animal would have. In my mind, as I read this, he immediately popped in my mind, he showed as much wisdom as the dumb goose that caused us several years ago to have put um, opaque plastic on the back windows of all of our doors coming in because we had this male goose that saw his reflection in that window and he would go fight that reflection. And the more it hurt as he picked the window, the more angry he would get. And he'd fight and fight until there was blood all over the windows. Senseless, dumb brute. Envying the wicked is just like that. The truth of the matter is, is as soon as Asaph stops to think about it, he has the eternal assurance of the sovereign God that he will be with God in glory for all eternity. Look at verse 24. Afterwards, receive me to glory. That, that word glory is the same word used in the Old Testament for God's presence that filled the Holy of Holies in the temple. Right where Asaph ministered, there was the Holy of Holies, the inner place where only one person, the high priest, could go only one time of year to make atonement for the people. It wasn't accessible to Asaph. He could never go into the Holy of Holies where God's glory manifested itself. But Asaph knew after this life, he would spend eternity in the very presence of God. Not only that, but even now, he's experiencing God's presence, God's nearness. Even when he was doubting, he recognizes that God never deserted him. God is so much greater than any of the things that he was using for a comparison in the first half there of the psalm. God is so much better than that. Why would he desire those things when he has God? Why would we? Why would I? When I have God. Recognizing all this, it leaves only one thing for a psalmist to do. There, there's no further comparison that's necessary. Instead, his sole purpose is to tell of all God's works to those who will hear them. If you recall, I, I pointed out that, that verse 2 began with a strong, emphatic contrast. The, the words, but as for me. Asaph knew the intellectual truth about God's goodness, but as for me, that truth didn't seem to, to align with observation. Well, Asaph uses that same strong contrast three times in our psalm. Three more times. Four times total. Unfortunately, the New American Standard, and nor any of our English translations that I looked at, fail, they, they all fail to translate it consistently. So we don't see that he's using the same thing over and over. But we can use this strong contrast, but as for me, to trace the flow of his thoughts. Ace of doubts because of observations, beginning in verse 2, until we hit verse 22, but as for me, I was senseless and ignorant. That's the literal translation. His, his doubts were wrong. Verse 23, literally, But as for me, I am continually with you. God's presence 
is real. It's the only ultimate reality. Verse 28. But as for me, the nearness of my God is good. Surely, verse 1, God is good to Israel. The nearness of my God is good. Experiencing relationship with God is the only thing that carries ultimate value. I already have the eternal assurance of the sovereign God. So let's bring this home for us. I think it's nearly impossible to read verse 28 through our our New Testament lens. It's impossible to think, but as for me, the nearness of my God is good without thinking of Ephesians 2 verse 13. Ephesians 2, verse 13, Paul writes, But now in Christ Jesus, you who, were formerly, who, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We look around at the world. We compare ourselves to others, and, and we end up in discouragement, much like Asaph does. But that is ignorance. That is senselessness. That is like a brute beast. Christ has brought us near to God. Let's think this through. Those who are worldly, those who live without submitting to God in their lives, face his judgment. An eternal damnation that is coming to all who are worldly. That was us. That was us. That is what we deserve. We deserved that punishment. We were far from God and had zero desire to do anything about it. Even if we happened to have a desire, there was nothing we could do, but we didn't even have a desire. We were happy living our lives in rebellion against God. But God sent Christ to change that. God sent his own son to die in our place. And then, having lived a sinless life, dying, satisfying the wrath of God, He rose from the dead victorious. After all of that, God moved in our lives to share us that faith in Jesus Christ is all that it takes to draw near to God. Through the blood of Christ, we can be near to God. Now, there may be somebody here today that has never accepted Jesus as Savior. If that's the case, talk to me. Send me an email this week. Let me share with you the the fullness of what Christ has done for us. God has brought us near by drawing us to faith in Christ. And unless you have that faith in Christ, you are still far from God. Don't live like that goose pounding against the window. Draw near to God. God brought us near, drawing us to faith in Christ, applying His righteousness to our lives. Now, we are in Christ, secure for all eternity. The the final verse of our psalm, it uses an infrequent double name for God. There's a number of Hebrew words that that are names for God, but two of them were put together, and and these two are not put together too often. If the Hebrew words Adonai Yahweh, we have it translated in the New American Standard, at least as Lord God. But, but this combination emphasizes God's sovereignty. In fact, several English translations translate it that way. as They translate it as sovereign God. Our refuge is the sovereign God of the universe when we are in Christ. Why? Why would anything that happens cause us to have discouragement when our reality is that we are in Christ having a refuge in the sovereign God. I'd summarize the entire idea of this psalm for us as as New Testament believers this way. We handle discouragement by renewing our focus on Christ. If we are in Christ, nothing can shake us. The sovereign God is our refuge. He's placed us through the blood of Christ into an eternal promise. In fact, a true focus on our ultimate reality, rather than 
than, than present appearances. That's our contrast. There's an ultimate reality, but there's the present appearances. Focusing on ultimate reality rather than the present appearance, it will cause us to respond just like Asaph. We will want to tell others of the nearness that we have to God. We will want to tell them that we've been brought close to the one who made us. We will want to tell of God's works, which find their fulfillment in our Savior. Christ will so consume our lives and Christ will so consume our thoughts that there is no room for discouragement. The reason discouragement comes is we let I and they push us away from thoughts of Christ. We handle discouragement by renewing our focus on Christ. Psalm 73, the, the problem? I envy the lifestyles of the worldly. The resolution? I remember the ultimate reality of God. We handle discouragement by renewing our focus on Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is our ultimate reality. We are in him if we have faith in him. Father, my prayer this morning, if there is someone here that does not have faith in Jesus Christ, Father, draw them to him so that they can come near to you. Father, for any who is here this morning being discouraged because of the circumstances of life, because this is a hard world we live in. It's a broken world. It's a a world that's been ruptured, damaged by sin, Father, I pray that you would renew that person today by renewing their focus on Jesus Christ, their Savior. Father, may we respond to the ultimate reality rather than to present appearance. And may we tell others of the great joy that we have in our Savior, the great hope that we have in our Savior, the eternal hope that we have in our Savior. May we live for him. In his name we pray, amen.